test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. A woman wants to find out about a paragliding course. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 676, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. OK, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here, clothes, uh... Wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long sleeve t-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. 
we do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. OK, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. Uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. OK, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams and I really do need to study. OK then, let's make it the one after the exams. Fine, we'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out some... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to a man talking to a group of people at a weekend work conference in a hotel. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. OK, can everyone listen again now, please? Now you know how much of the weekend will be work and what some of the meetings and sessions are about, I'd like to tell you something about how you can spend some of the free time you have over the weekend, both inside the hotel and outside in the town centre. As I've said, you'll be free from around five today and on Saturday and from lunchtime on Sunday and there's plenty to do. This is the first time we've had the conference at the Royal Spa Hotel, and I'm sure you'll agree it's a very nice place. Really, there's no need to leave the hotel at all if you don't want to, but I'm sure some of you will want to get out for a change of environment. OK, first, restaurants and bars. I'm sure you all saw that there was a bar near the entrance as you came into the hotel, but there are actually two more bars. One is also on the ground floor, behind the main restaurant, and the other is on the top floor. That one has a very nice terrace where you can sit outside and enjoy the view. That bar is for hotel guests only and is usually a bit quieter. As I say, the main restaurant is on the ground floor. We will have breakfast and lunch there, so you'll get to know it well. There is also a smaller restaurant for coffee, sandwiches and snacks on the third floor and that is also only for hotel guests. There is a gym and health club in the basement. The gym has a good range of equipment and is open from 7am. I know some of you were talking about a swimming pool but unfortunately there is no swimming pool. I will tell you where there is a pool close to the hotel in a moment. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, I hope to see some of you around the hotel over the weekend, but I'm sure you will want to get out and see the town at some point. 
If you'd like to look at the map on the screen, I'll show the area around the hotel. There is a map of the town centre in your welcome pack too. OK, you can see the hotel here in the middle of the map and the main entrance here at the top in Carlisle Street. OK, that swimming pool I promised to tell you about is here in Cromwell Road. If you turn right out of the hotel, it's about 10 minutes up the road in the third street on the left. It's open until 7pm and until 5 on Sunday. There's a very nice park here to the north, again about 10 minutes away. In the middle of the park is a boating lake, so if the weather's good on Sunday, it might be a nice way to relax. If you want to see a movie this evening or on Saturday night, the cinema is here, in the high street. Come out of the hotel and turn left. The high street is only three minutes away. The cinema is here at the top of the street, next to a fairly large car park. Now, restaurants. There is a good Chinese restaurant in the middle of the high street, here on the right. It's directly opposite the town hall. It's called the White Orchid. Another very nice restaurant is Leonardo's. It does Spanish and Mexican food. It's here, at the bottom of the high street. So, turn left at the end of Carlisle Street, walk down for five minutes, and you'll see it on the other side of the road. I went to Leonardo's last time I was here, so I can recommend it. Now, if anyone wants to see some live music, there is always a jazz band playing at the Pink Coconut. Yeah, that's right, the Pink Coconut. That's here, in a little street behind the hotel. The street name is not on the map, but it's easy to find. Turn right out of the main entrance, and then take the first right to go back round to the back of the hotel. So... I think that's everything. Please ask me if you have anything else. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? 
Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? And we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose. There's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay. And you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure. He gave us them in the lecture. Let's see. You get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on local businesses at a university business centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40.
The subject of this evening's talk at the North Bank Business Centre is local businesses in the area surrounding the university and the benefit they bring to the employment prospects of people in the local area, especially young people at the beginning of their career. We established the centre in response to approaches from several business people in the area who had wanted to start up new businesses but who had not managed to find any help locally and did not know where to turn. Moreover, they had all, without exception, come up against enormous bureaucratic obstacles. We therefore invited them in as a group to meet the members of the department and the students. Stemming from that is the centre, which now focuses mainly but not exclusively on business startups. Just after the centre was set up, snapshot research conducted by the department over the telephone gave some startling results. The information about local businesses revealed that three out of every ten local business startups that we could collect information on had failed within the first six months, and another five had gone within the year, leaving only two. The most common reasons given for the business's closing were, first, high rents, which are 33% higher than the national average due to the area being very central. Second, lack of knowledge about grants, basically because of ignorance about how to access them. And thirdly, a lack of business support, because they did not know where to obtain advice from. Since the centre came into existence three years ago, we have helped change this climate of failure. The current statistics show a remarkable turnaround in the fortunes of local businesses. And now, after a year, only two businesses close out of every ten, compared to eight before the centre was set up. Six local businesses are now taking part in a work placement and monitoring scheme, which is of mutual benefit to ourselves and the companies involved. O Foods, a small start-up company with nine employees involved in organic food and based at a local market, has one final year graduate doing a year-long study on improving the stock turnaround. This was a particular problem because the company found that they were losing sometimes up to 30% of their stock. Another start-up is Innovations, which deals with producing video games. This company, which employs only five people, all under the age of 25, is receiving support in attracting business partners and achieving production targets. In the smaller business category, Sampson's Limited, a courier company which is interested in developing a taxi service, is being offered help with their business expansion plans. Another small niche company called Vintage Scooter, which specialises in revamping old scooters, is taking part in a product monitoring scheme, offering customer service up to a year after purchase to check the quality of their restoration. The first of the two medium-sized companies that the scheme is monitoring is Build Limited, which employs 47 people. A comparison of their products and services with other businesses in the area is being carried out by a researcher who is trying to support them in their efforts to extend the company's product range. The last company, Jones Systems, is perhaps the most interesting because it has been the victim of considerable personnel problems, which have been affecting the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And so, we are looking at conflict management and team building within the company. To sum up, advisors help the companies look at different business options and models, apply for grants, deal with employment issues, systems creation, and also provide accommodation at the centre to help them start up. E-mentoring for fledgling businesses 
is also in operation for those who find it difficult to attend the centre personally. The programme is funded by grants from local authorities. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.